I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning service for 20 September 2020. Uh, thank you so much for joining with us and a hearty greeting to all of uh, Open Door Baptist Church of Melton and anyone who is listening in and watching this morning, you are very, very welcome to, to uh, be a part of our service, so to speak. And our hearts are full of gratitude to our wonderful God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who has saved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, who has given us great and exceeding precious promises uh, that we can be uh, uh, inherit uh, all of the uh, expectations of God's children by faith in his word and uh, looking forward to the ultimate glorification of our bodies. Uh, when we go to be with him, whether through the Lord's return or through the valley of the shadow of death, God will still be with us. And so there's much for us to be thankful for. Uh, there'll be available an evening service uh, tonight at 6 p.m., continuing our series in Psalm 139, looking at the, uh, the God as our creator. We're going to see God's handiwork in the womb in the evening service and I hope you'll return and uh, watch that with your family. Uh, they're uh, continuing on our Explorer ministry on a Friday night. Thankful for all those that have been coming to our midweek Skype prayer meeting Wednesday 7 o'clock and also a Sunday morning prayer meeting 10 o'clock. Please avail yourself of that uh, to uh, pray with uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know the ladies have had some extra prayer meeting and are continuing their ladies' studies. And so we're thankful for what God is doing. Also, the lessening of cases that we're seeing across the state. So please join with me for a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for our service today. We thank you for the uh, ability that we have to uh, worship you in this format we miss the assembling of ourselves together and lord it is, it is not through our neglect it is it is not through our lack of wanting uh, there are some necessary precautions at the moment that we abide by and uh, we want to be in submission to our earthly authorities as you command and we pray that you would give wisdom to those in authority that their decisions would be wise and careful and would strike the right balance between uh, public health and also our own liberties that we uh, that we uh, have in this country. And so we commit all this into your hands. We know the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it with us whoever he will. And we acknowledge that you are in control and sovereign over all things and all people. Lord, today may you give us a sense of your greatness and your mercy and your kindness to us uh, lord through our continuation of the study of joseph and his dealings with his brothers and the works of god through this man and through his family that you would teach us valuable valuable lessons that we might be better equipped uh, to serve you in this day and age uh, lord we are, we are here this time by your appointment uh, Lord, there are no accidents with your plan, and we thank you for that. How we pray, uh, Lord, for our missionaries today. Uh, we think of those who are serving you, Liberia, in uh, those ministering in, in ministries in Mauritius, PNG, India, even here in Australia. Uh, got some going through many trials, uh, some right in the middle of COVID-19, we ask for your mercy and safety upon each one and that they would continue to serve you where you have called them and lord as we serve you here in melbourne help us to take the opportunities you give us uh, lord a word for you here and there to point others towards your wonderful son we commit those in our church who are enduring afflictions at the moment who have health concerns who have surgery coming up who have ongoing treatment Lord, those uh, bereaved of loved ones, we commit each one to you. Uh, Lord, we thank you for bringing people to our church even just before uh, services were, were shut down. We pray that you would encourage those who have newly come to the church 
and uh, that despite the distance that we could be a true church family to them and uh, those around us. And so, Father, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would see fit to unite our hearts, bind us in fellowship and love, and take God's word that has been prepared and to shed, shed the truth of God's word abroad in our hearts and day by day conform us more and more to the likeness of your Son. As Paul tells the Ephesians that we would be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner person that we could comprehend with all the saints the depth and length and breadth and height to know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding that for us to be filled with all the fullness of God. And we bring you glory with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our Bible reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 44, from verse 1 to verse 13. And he, that is Joseph, commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up, follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words. And they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from your Lord's house? For whomever of your servants it is found, let him die. And we also will be my Lord's slaves. And he said, Now also let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack, so he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be. Daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works, not mine. Saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by Love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is appeased. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath. anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He has the one 
Well, this morning we are in Genesis chapter 44, and I have called this message, The Plot Thickens. The Plot Thickens, not an entirely original uh, sermon title, but we will see the twists and turns that uh, occurs between Joseph and his brothers as uh, the hand of God ultimately moves them all towards reunion and reconciliation. Uh, last week we're in Genesis chapter 43 and we saw the brothers all banqueting in Joseph's Egyptian home. He favours his full brother Benjamin, the youngest of the twelve, with uh, five times as many servings. And you could imagine that an Egyptian feast would have been a, a, a generous display anyway. And yet Benjamin receives five times as much as his brothers. Uh, not that Joseph is trying to sinfully favour Benjamin, I don't think, but rather, uh, as it's been suggested by many, that he is testing the response of the other ten. Uh, how will they respond to favouritism? Uh, will they respond the same murderous way they did towards him? all of those many decades ago. But thankfully, uh, the brothers respond positively. They're just glad to be in Joseph's home and alive and uh, being treated well. They're able to overlook the obvious, the obvious favoritism that uh, this uh, strange Egyptian leader is showing to their youngest brother. And what we find at the end of Genesis chapter 43 is Jacob's prayer for God's mercy of the Almighty coming to pass. The patriarchal blessing is bearing fruit uh, even in his own family. As uh, one writer said, these brothers do seem to be moving in the right direction, finally. Uh, they promise to take blame for any catastrophe. They are taking a measure of responsibility. They uh, acknowledge their culpability and want to make restitution for the money that Joseph put back in their sacks uh, the first time they returned to Egypt. They take their uh, displays of honesty. Uh, they seek to retrieve their brother uh, from prison in Egypt. There is unity. They recognize that God is at work in their midst. There is belief. They're able to rejoice at their provisions. Even when their brother Benjamin is receiving more than they were, there is at least a modicum of uh, gratitude. And it, it does confirm the truth that people do change and can change. Uh, often it is slower than we would like. Yes, our obedience ought to be faster than it is. And yet people being people uh, are not always very quick off the mark. And so at the end of chapter 43, we have some very unworthy brothers feasting with their worthy brother, Joseph. A wonderful reminder, a token of the gospel that would come, uh, God welcoming sinners uh, to an eternal love feast, uh, eternal glory in heaven with himself. Uh, what a promise, uh, what we have to look forward to as God's children. And so we come to Genesis chapter 44 this morning, and I think we'll be able to cover the entire chapter in the time that we have. And Joseph, again, again, uh, insists on uh, throwing some spanners into the works as their brothers seek to return a second time to Egypt. He has his servant uh, putting uh, back their, their money. Again, he won't let his brothers pay for this food. He wants to be a blessing to them. But also, but also, there's another twist. And that is that he has his own silver cup, his own silver cup uh, put into the sack of Benjamin. And of course, the implication is, think about this, the implication is that that Benjamin, who for reasons they're not aware, receives five times as much from this Egyptian ruler at lunch the previous day, then steals the man's cup. <laughs> talk, talk about ingratitude. Talk about ingratitude. Imagine being favoured five times as much 
as your other brothers and as as a as a parting thank you you steal the cup of the lord who gave it to you and so joseph again is is testing their responses and so he arranges his servant to return the money and to put his own cup the cup of a great ruler into benjamin's sack and and again the brothers the brothers uh, will ultimately from their own from their own mouth um, put themselves into a terrible situation uh, joseph is uh, not just playing with them uh, he is not just like a cat with a, a wounded mouse a wounded mice that he wants to ruin and torture before eating um, he, he is drawing out their heart and uh, the brothers who uh, who are uh, found with their money back in their in their sacks when joseph sends his servant to catch up with them uh, yeah, uh, again reply from verse 6 through to verse 9 with this answer of well it is illogical that we would take our money back with us a second time why would they try and return to egypt for food and then again bring their own money back with them but they they they, they overreach they overreach because they are so confident of their innocence they will all take responsibility they say in verse 10 now also let it be according to your words he with whom it shall it is found shall be my slave and you shall be blameless so this is joseph's response uh, the brothers offer in verse 9 with whomever of your servants it is found let him die and we also will be my lord's slaves and so they are they are saying that look um whoever has the cup he's going to die and the rest of us will be your slaves well joseph isn't seeking to kill any of them and and he says in verse 10 as i read earlier um the one that is found out he will be my slave the rest of you can go free the rest of you can go free and then there is a search on and uh of course the cup is found in benjamin's sack and notice what happens in verse 13 verse 13 they each tore their clothes they they mourn collectively because they know what it's going to mean to their father having benjamin stay behind and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city and so they go back to egypt the servant only wants benjamin do you know when they sold joseph as a slave all of those years ago it's only it's only reuben that tears his clothes now with benjamin becoming the next slave in egypt as far as they're they are aware all of them collectively tear their clothes what is happening with these 10 they are learning empathy and unity they are learning to think as 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 brothers they know what this will mean for their father jacob they know that if they return home a second time to Egypt, to canaan without uh, benjamin now uh, this this will take their father to his grave this will destroy the old man and so they have they have a plan they have a plan it says in verse 14 so judah and his brothers came to joseph's house judah is taking leadership leadership and he was still there and they fell before him on the ground and joseph said to them what deed is this you have done did you not know that such a man as i can certainly practice divination then judah said what shall we say to my lord what shall we speak or how shall we clear ourselves god has found out the iniquity of your servants here we are my lord's slaves both we and also he with whom the cup was found i don't believe joseph was practicing divination he is speaking hypothetically 
as the average Egyptian man did. He still hasn't revealed his identity. Joseph can hide behind his Egyptian uh, front, so to speak. But we have Judah now taking the initiatives. He says, God has found out the iniquity of your servants, plural. I think Judah is seeing a bigger picture here. How much Judah has has changed from the womanizer many years ago. Uh, Judah is becoming the statesman of the great tribe through whom Christ would come. And Judah says, here we are, verse 16, my Lord slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. Uh, Judah is showing solidarity and identification with the guilty brother, Benjamin. Now we know he's not really guilty, but he is found with Joseph's cup. And again, Judah is foretelling us of the Savior who would come, who identifies with us in our sin and in our guilt and in our guiltiness before God. But Joseph presses his brothers even further. He says in verse 17, no, I just, it's just going to be the person that took my cup. The rest of you, you can go in peace to your father. You can go in shalom to your father. But the brothers know that if they return home without Benjamin, Jacob will have no shalom. He'll have no peace, only death. And so the question is, are, are the brothers now, are the ten willing to leave Benjamin in Egypt and return home with food? Are they willing to do that how much have his brothers really changed and judah now gives the appeal of his life <laughs> judah from verse 18 to verse 23 gives the appeal of his life he rises to the occasion in in literally pleading for the life not only of benjamin but also of his father and in these verses, Joseph, sorry, Judah recounts the events so far. That it was Joseph all along that wanted them to confirm the existence of the younger brother. And that is why, that is why they brought Benjamin back to Egypt. Even though Jacob didn't really want that, but, but ultimately willing because they're facing starvation. And, and, and now Joseph wants Benjamin as a slave. This will, this will be an end to their father, Jacob. And so from 18 to 23, Judah recounts the events up to the present. And from 24 to 29 gives Joseph some new insights into what happened to his family all those years ago. It, it, it is Judah's advocacy that is very powerful in the heart of Joseph. Look at what Judah says from 24 to 29. So it was when we went up to your servant, my father, that we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, go back and buy us a little food. But, but we said, we cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. For we may not see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Now, we, we remember that back in Genesis 43. Then your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. This was Rachel and this is, of course, Joseph and Benjamin, Judah's talking about. And the one went out from me, and I said, surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. That's what he thinks happened to Joseph all those years ago. But notice this in verse 29, but if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, this is Benjamin, something bad happens to Benjamin in Egypt, you shall bring down my gray, gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Now think of that vivid imagery. You shall bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. 
This is what Judah tells Joseph to his face. Our fathers told us that if something happens to Benjamin, this will be the end of me. Joseph hears what those events all those years ago did to his father. This hurt his father greatly. Remember back in Genesis 37 that Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, mourned for his son many days, and that his sons and daughters arose to comfort him, but he would not be comforted. For he said, this is back in Genesis 37, 20 plus years ago, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And so Jacob, the father, had, had, had the same words of mourning for Joseph all those years ago. Now he will have them for Benjamin. Do you know, the brothers never forgot Joseph, but they carried the guilt and the silence because they'd done the sin and they'd never come clean with their father. They, they carried guilt that was multiplied. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He that covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. These brothers had hid and they'd hid and they'd concealed and they'd hidden and kept quiet. This awful truth. How it must have hurt their relationship with their father. They could never really be honest with him. And Judah opens up to Joseph. And Joseph realizes how much his father missed him. And how this would hurt him if Benjamin stayed in Egypt. Now notice what Judah says in 30 to 32. Very important. Now therefore when I come to your servant my father. And the lad is not with us. Benjamin doesn't come back. Since his life is bound up in the lad's life. It will happen. When he sees that the lad is not with us. That he will die. So your servants will bring down the grey hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. And so Judah says, well, Judah says to this Egyptian ruler, Joseph, if you keep Benjamin, our brother, this will kill our father. And Judah will take responsibility. He says, for your servant became surety for the lad to my father. Remember, Judah offers to guarantee Benjamin's safety. What's very clear from Judah's speech is that Joseph had made idols out of Joseph and then Benjamin. These were the sons of his beloved wife, Rachel, the woman that he only really loved. And he never really attached himself to the other ten, sadly, sadly. Uh, it wasn't the other son's fault what family they were born in or what mother they came from. It wasn't their choice. But Jacob had showed favoritism to his sons unnecessarily. Later, in Exodus 20, Moses, from the hand of the Lord, would tell the nation of Israel not to have any other gods before the Lord. And and Jacob, on a personal level, despite being a patriarch, had, had made idols out of his sons and had caused incredible problems within the family. And so what Judah asks from 33 and 34 is this, Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of, of the lad as a serv as a slave to my lord judah says i'll be the slave i'll be the slave and let the lad go up with his brothers let benjamin go home to egypt set him free let him go back sorry to canaan to be with our father i'll stay says judah again a wonderful picture of substitution substitution he says for how shall i go up to my father if the lad is not with me lest perhaps I would see the evil that would come upon my father. Judah is willing to become a slave so that his father can have the son he really loves, 
how much Judah has grown. Judah had learned to accept his father Jacob for who he was. A flawed man who had the promise of God. Think about that. Judah had to accept, look, my father Jacob, warts and all. He's God's man with God's promise. I know he loves Benjamin more than the rest of us, but I just accept him for who he is. And in personal relationships, you know, we can pray that God will change people, but we cannot change people. Otherwise, we're going to be eternally frustrated with most of our human relationships. Judah is growing rapidly. It doesn't excuse Jacob's favoritism. Doesn't excuse it. But Judah is, is growing and doesn't want his father hurt anymore. His father has lost his wife, Rachel. Uh, Judah knows the part they played in the selling of Joseph all those years ago. But they won't break their father's heart a second time. They don't want Jacob to die of a broken heart. This was a great gesture on the part of Judah. He's going to be a substitute. And I might add this morning that when we talk about the death of Christ, the only orthodox view, the only acceptable view of the reason why Jesus came to die on a cross is that he came to die as our substitute in our place one for the other god's righteous man his righteous son for unrighteous humanity jesus came to die as a substitute any other theory of the atonement is inadequate and unbiblical and so we see substitution coming out again and again love is willing to make sacrifices Judah is willing to make a loving sacrifice of himself. Judah is becoming worthy of his future inheritance. As one writer said, true as Judah, who all those years ago suggested that they sell Joseph in chapter Genesis 37, and it was Judah who unwittingly committed incest with his daughter-in-law in chapter 38, but by the grace of God, people can change and make new beginnings. Let's remember Judah for his courageous and compassionate speech and not for his foolish sins. What a blessing. Judah starts to shine. He's changed. Think about in Revelation 5 in the throne room of heaven when, when John tells the heavenly elders, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll to loose the seven seals. The lion of the tribe of Judah is also the lamb as it had been slain. And Judah prefigures the lamb who would come, who would substitute himself for sinners on the cross. I wonder, have you accepted, have you accepted Christ Jesus as your substitute? If you come to the place where you realize that that Jesus Christ on the cross took your sins in his own place. Now I want to finish this morning by, by going back to verse 30. Verse 30. I want to finish by looking again at verse 30. When Judah says, Now therefore when I come to your servant my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life. That expression, since his life, Jacob's life, is bound up in Benjamin's life. The father's life bound up in the son's life. Now, again, Jacob had an unhealthy favoritism toward Joseph and then Benjamin. Do you know what Judah should have said? Instead of him saying, our father's life is bound up in Benjamin's life, he should have said, he should have been able to have said, I should say, our father's life is bound up in the promises made by God to Abraham. That's what he should have said. 
Jacob, at the end of his life, should have had his life bound up in God's promises, not favoritism to a son. Remember, Abraham is willing to give up his son. That's how much Abraham's life was bound up in God's covenant promises. I wonder, what is your life, what is my life bound up in today? What does our life depend on? What drives us? What matters most to us? You know, Paul in Colossians 3 says that since you're raised with Christ, we're to seek the things that are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, we're to set our minds on things above, not on things of the earth. Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 3, for you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Our life, its meaning, its purpose, its eternity is bound up in the very life of Christ, God's Son. Our life is bound up in the Son's life. And so what we're seeing in Genesis 44 today is glimpses of the gospel. Christ would come from Judah, our substitute. And those who have been redeemed by Christ, where to find our identity, where to find our purpose in Jesus. And not in things of the earth. We saw how much trouble is caused by idolatry, even in a family. And we can see what promise there is when those in the family like Judah, like Joseph, look above what's going on in the family and they look to God to see what he is up to and the way he wants to transform and change us. So may the lessons of Genesis 44 encourage us today and would drive us to this, to this conclusion that our life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen.
our benediction this morning will be from Colossians chapter 3. It's worth having those words rehearsed again. Where Paul tells the Colossians, If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Amen.